I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you this morning. Uh, always enjoy visiting here, seeing brethren uh, of like-minded faith, uh, striving to only do God's will. If you want to, very quickly, turn to Jeremiah chapter 7. Jeremiah chapter 7. We're going to read here just to kind of uh, get our minds focused on uh, what we're looking at in relation to our topic this morning. You know, my topic basically is the, the gospel destroys the love of sinning. We look around our world today and we have a lot of people who really love to sin. Now they won't label it as sin, but that's what the Bible defines it as. It's the way God views it. I want to look at an Old Testament passage before we get into the New, just simply to show us and to bring to our minds the idea that love of sin is not a new thing. It's always been a part of our world and of people in general. Beginning verse seven, verse 8, it says, Behold, you trust in lying words that cannot profit. Will you steal, murder, and commit adultery, and swear falsely, and burn incense unto Baal, and walk after other gods whom you know not? And come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, We are delivered to do all these abominations. In this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes. Behold, even I have seen it, saith the Lord. But go you now unto a place, unto my place, which was in Silo, where I set my name at the first, and see what I do to it for the wickedness of my people Israel. And now, because you have done all these works, saith the Lord, I spake unto you, rising up early and speaking, but you heard not. And I called you, but you answered not. Therefore will I do unto this house, which is called by my name, wherein you trust, and unto the place which I gave to you and to your fathers, as I have done to Shiloh. And I will cast you out of my sight, as I have cast out all your brethren, even the whole seed of Ephraim. Therefore pray not thou for this people, Neither cry, lift up cry nor prayer for them, neither make intercession to me, for I will not hear thee. Reading that brings chills to my bones. And the idea that God could look at his creation, his people, and cut them off. Why? Because they loved the sin. Is this an important issue? Yes. You're cut off from God, the one who can save you, because of your sin, because of your love of sin. Right now, because it's all advertised all over the internet, social media, news, everywhere, Mardi Gras. I know y'all probably heard of it. What does Mardi Gras represent? The love of God's creation that loves to sin. And yet, a caveat to that is just simply, well, but after we have this little time where we're all going to go out here and live this way and sin freely, then we'll have a period of Lent where we'll become more pious. God said, I will not hear you. I will cut you off. If those, we supposedly live in a Christian nation. Now I know that, that what that means, it's just like calling somebody a Christian today. Is that the biblical definition or is that just a worldly definition? The long suffering of God is all that is keeping this earth in the situation we are today. But more and more, sadly, even more and more, my brethren love to sin. And 
they still will worship. They'll still come out on Sunday mornings or Sunday nights. They'll still come out and, and be a part of things, and yet they want to see him. They love seeing. If you would turn over to 1 John chapter 3. I don't know if y'all have noticed these topics, but Bruce just touched on all of ours. And uh, from here on out, that's just the way it's going to be. You're going to hear a lot of repetition today because, well, we're all preaching from the same book. In 1 John chapter 3. Well, I gotta get over to it. Let's begin at verse 4. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not, and whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. For his sin remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. You know, if you were to ask the world, what is the definition of sin? I don't know what kind of definitions you'd get. I don't know what kind of replies you would get. Because sin has been basically stricken from our English language, and people just don't want to hear that word. Because they love to sin. They love to sin. You know, some say, well, it's nothing more than a violation of human relationships. In other words, if I do something against you, I've sinned. And some can easily be resolved just simply by correcting that problem, and therefore I'm not in sin anymore. Now, some sins may be a violation of human relationships, but the true meaning of sin goes much further than that. The literal meaning of the word sin is to miss the mark comes from harmatia. Like when an archer fails to hit the center of the target. So sin is some kind of action or a lack of it in which one fails to meet the goal intended by God. And John defines it as lawlessness or transgression of the law. The word for lawlessness or transgression is anomia, which literally means illegally. It's something that's done illegally or against the law. In other words, you break or violate the law, such as the law of God. Where the Bible says, thou shalt not steal, and if you go out and steal, you have now broken or violated, done something illegal to God's law. So sin occurs when you do what is forbidden by God, which is commonly a, what we call the sin of commission. James 4 and verse 17 defines it also as uh, to fail to do that which is good or commanded. And we call that the sin of omission. In other words, we fail to love our brother or... While you may not do ill will toward your brother, you fail to do good to that brother, and that is a sin in and of itself because you have omitted other parts of the law. And in both of these definitions of sin, one has failed to meet a certain standard. In other words, they've missed the mark. And in this case, the standard is the law of God, which when carefully noted is designed 
to help us in our relationships with God, with other people, and even our own selves. Every command of God, both negative and positive, affect these three relationships in some way. But where did the sin come from? Well, his origin is Satan, the devil. Verse 8. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. From the beginning, the devil has, made the, has been the father or origin of sin. He is the liar and the father of it. James 4, verse 8, verse 24, 44 and following. So when we miss the mark by either doing which is forbidden or failing to do that which was commanded, we demonstrate the influence that Satan has on us. How do we defeat it? Well, in chapter, uh, chapter verse 5, as well as in verse 8, that was the purpose for Jesus coming. He was revealed to take away our sins. He came to take away our sins. And for this purpose, the Son of God then will destroy the works of Satan. As John the Baptist declared, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John 1 and verse 29. But to continue to walk in sin, therefore, is to undermine the purpose of the Lord's coming. I want you to think about that. If I continue in sin, I am undermining the purpose of why Jesus came and died. What did it cost Jesus? Well, nothing more than his own death. And nothing less than his shedding of his precious blood. Then verse 6 and 7. He says, whoever abides in him does not sin. The phrase does not sin is in the present tense. It suggests the idea that I do not continue on sinning. He's not talking about the momentary lapse here. He's not talking about here the temptation and sometimes we overcome by temptation. But he's talking about the manner of life. As a Christian, I live to not sin. That's what I'm looking forward to. John has already told us in 1 John, verse 8 and verse 10, chapter 1, verse 8 and 10, that Christians sin. And to say that we don't have sin, we, we make God a liar. And he says, and the truth is not in us. So John is talking about those who uh, who continually practice sin. And such is true of those who abide in him. Those who abide in Jesus will not continually engage in sin. And that is because they let that which has been heard from the beginning abide in them. In other words, the word of Jesus, chapter 2, verse 24. And then they strive to walk as Jesus walked, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 6. But the one who continually practices sin has neither seen Jesus nor known him, despite any claims to the contrary. There are a lot of people today who claim Jesus as their Savior but they refuse to claim Jesus as their Lord. And that is where we have the problem. Verse 9 says, Whoever has been born of God does not sin. Again, John uses the present tense. In other words, he does not continue to sin. That's the idea here. He's not saying that when you become a Christian, you never sin. No. He's saying you do not continue in sin. But one that is truly born of God does not continuously practice sin. And why is that? Well, he tells us. Because his seed remains in him. What is the seed? The word of God. 
You want to know why elders and leaders of the congregation are always harping and, and trying to keep in your mind focused? Read your Bible. Study your Bible. Why is that? Because the seed, the Word of God, will help you to live a life in accordance to God's will. As long as one allows the seed or the word of God to remain in him, he is born of God. As such, he does not continuously practice sin. Nor can he continuously practice sin if the seed is remaining in him. And instead, he continuously practices righteousness. Chapter 3 and verse 7. You know, sin can be fun. It can be deceiving. It can bring such great worldly bliss. But it does not bring true happiness. Sin must be understood before we can appreciate what the Bible teaches regarding sin. Sin separates us from God. It costs the life of Jesus on the cross. And for the Christian who will not give up that sin, it crucifies the Son of God afresh. Hebrews 6, verse 4 and following. So why are so many today seemingly doing nothing or as little as possible to, to take sin out of their lives? Well, some say, well, they just don't know any better. Some say, well, they're just ignorant. And there's no doubt in my mind there are people out here in our world that are that way. But it boils down to is because man loves to sin. What about those who are Christians? They find themselves going back into the world, giving up the grace of God that can and will save them. They find themselves loving parts of the world that truly are against the very nature of God. They seem not to care at all who they hurt. And most definitely the absolute refusal to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. They don't have true biblical faith. The faith that is a real kind of faith that produces a hatred for sin. And a hatred for the practices of the world that involves sin. Psalm 119 verse 104 says, Through thy precepts I get understanding. Therefore I hate every false way. To have the true faith that the Bible produces, it makes the person realize that we must really hate sin. And we do this by understanding exactly what, what is that sin, what does it cost? Well, faith in Christ is necessary to hate sin. The Bible itself requires this type of sin. John 3 and verse 16 tells us that the degree that God loves us, he gave us his son to die because of that sin. And therefore we must understand that Jesus died for our sins and not someone else. Faith we must have that Jesus was raised from the dead. This is an important part of the, of the gospel, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 through 4. And with the proper faith, Jesus was the beloved Son of God. He was the promised Messiah. God gave loved us enough to send him to die on the cross and then raised him from the grave on the third day. And with that kind of faith then we realize that sin is responsible for the death of Christ. We realize the pain and suffering he went through for us. And then we have no alternative then we have true biblical faith to hate every false way we hate sin because of what it did it separated us from God we hate sin because of what it cost the death of Jesus and we also hate sin because of what it can do to any Christian who will not repent so 
Well, the rest of this morning, we're going to look at Romans chapter 5. Y'all, you know, human nature is we always are looking for loopholes. Christian wants to stay one foot in the world, one foot in the church. He says, well, I've got to figure out some way to do that so that my conscience is clear. I can be happy living worldly and yet be a member of the church. Well, Paul looked at this and dealt with this very issue, this idea of how that some felt that because of the grace of God, they had the ability then to live in the world, and they're racking up grace points. So when they sin, God's going to cover that sin. And the more I do good, the more grace I will get. And in their mind, they're saying, well, then that means I can sit over here and just take out a grace card when I sin. And I'm covered. I'm fine. But why would you even get to that point of thinking? Because these brethren found themselves in a situation where they love the world more than they love God. We're not going to be able to read all of this, but I want to kind of go over some of this because it is important for us to realize what Paul was getting at here. In verse 12 he says, as a man, and as one man sent Aaron into the world, and, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For under the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, and even over them that hath not sinned after a multitude, similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him who was to come. But not as the offense, but also is a free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. <clears throat> For the judgment was by one to condemnation. But the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. You know, you can, all, <clears throat> you can almost picture, because you talk to people every day, and when you get to talking to them about something and you're trying to show them that if you will do what's right, you'll receive more from God, you'll receive these things, and in their mind, they're just thinking, boy, if I do enough good, that'll, out, that'll outweigh all the bad. It's so on the day of judgment, I'll stand before God and he'll say, well, you had 50 bad things you did but you had 51 good things. Come on in. That's how man thinks. But you go on to read there, and in chapter 6, verse 1, that's the idea there. They, they saw a loophole. They said, now Paul's telling us the more we do, the more grace we'll get. God's going to take care of us. I can remain the way I am, but I just do a few good things and God's going to bless me. He begins at verse 1, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Paul, through the Holy Spirit, understood those people's hearts. They got directly to the matter. There is no loophole here. God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? When I become a Christian and I repent of my sins and I confess the name of Christ before men and I am baptized for, the, for my sins, I die to that old self. There is a death that happens. 
But you see, some want to say, well, okay, I get all that, and I understand, but, man, you know, that Mardi Gras real, looks real fun. And if I just do it on Saturday night, in other words, I'll be there Sunday morning. I just want to go Saturday night, see what all the fun's about. What's a few beers? What's a few this? What's a few of that? Then I'll show up Sunday morning, and I'll get my grace points. And that'll outweigh what I did on Saturday. Catholicism is based upon the idea that if you spend enough money and enough people pray for you, it doesn't matter what you do in this life, God's going to forgive you. But you don't have to change your life. There's nothing expected of you in a sense of you just got to spend enough. You got to pay us enough. You got to do enough of this, do enough of that. Say a few Hail Marys and, and, and confess to the priests occasionally and go and do all these manner of things. But you can go on about your life doing what you're doing. There's a man I knew, see him occasionally even now. I sat there and watched that man cussing, using the Lord's name in vain carrying on, talking about the drinking and stuff he'd do, and he was married. Then he talked about this girl that he was talking to online, and he'd go and he'd talk to her, and he went and had a few dates with her. Now remember, he's married. Okay. And this ain't that girl he's meeting. One day he sat, we were sitting there talking about the Bible and things like that, and you know what he told me? He was a deacon in the Baptist church. And so I sat there a moment trying to compose my thoughts and, and not be too over, well, like my wife says, I can be too blunt sometimes. But I just asked him, how can you be a deacon and you're involved in all this stuff? You know, denominational doctrine has confused the Bible and how people view the Bible. In his mind, he was not good. And he was born that way. And God knows what his failings are. And in the end, God's going to accept him because he knows he's not good. And he'll do enough good things so he'll get enough grace cards and in the end, he's going to go to heaven. Yet he's involved in all these other things. John tells us, if the seed abides in you, you will not sin. We cannot continue living that way. In chapter 6, verse 15, Paul writes again, he says, What then shall we sin because uh, we are not under the law but under grace? God forbid. That's this mindset. I'm under grace. I don't have to worry about dealing with all these other laws and all these other kind of things you're telling me because the grace of God is all that's going to save me. No. Paul says the grace of God and the adherence to God's will is what's going to save you. We are all under grace and law. We cannot accept the grace of uh, the law of grace without accepting its demands. Yes, it's a free gift, but there are things that we must do in order to secure it and keep it. We are to do only what God commands. And we are to hate sin in every false way. He says in verse 16, Know you not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. You have a master that you're going to save. And if you live like the world, your master is Satan. 
And if you won't give up sin, then you're not serving God. You're serving your master, which is Satan. We will serve one or the other. But God be thanked, verse 17, that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart the form of doctrine which was delivered to you. They obeyed the gospel. They have the principles that are given to us through God's word. And he says, but you were servants of sin. The idea of past tense. When you repented, you acknowledged that you sinned. And when you became a Christian, you acknowledged that I will, for this point on, hate anything that violates God's will. I'll give up sin. We will follow God and His will. Verse 18, being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. There is freedom that comes in Jesus Christ. Freedom from our sins. Freedom from sin and its penalty. And now we serve God. He goes on to say, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as you have yielded your members' servants to uncleanliness and to iniquity unto iniquity. Even so now yield your body's service to righteousness unto holiness. Christianity is not a Sunday only way of living. What you do tonight, if it is against the if it violates God's will, it is sin. And you can't just go tomorrow and get a pass for the rest of the week. Christianity is a way of life, 24-7. We serve and bring ourselves under subjection to God. Verse 20 says, For when you were servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. The, the answer to the majority of people, they might be able to do some good things. You know, Bill Gates does some good things in this world. But he won't give up sin. And in the mind of God, that means he serves Satan. Verse 20. For when you were servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. Uh, we already read that. Uh, they were still under a subjection to the God of this world. They were lost. It answers the question, does God hear sinners' prayers? If you're God is the God of this world, Satan. How can God hear your prayers? Because you're serving the wrong God. Verse 21. What fruit have you then in those things whereof you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. The world has many things that it will give you. It will promise you all manner of things. All you have to do is go back to look at the temptation of Jesus. Look at what Satan offered Jesus. Satan can offer that to you today. It can give you praise. It can pat you on the back. It can give you riches. It can give you great wealth. But none of those things will save your soul. Verse 22, but now being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. The fruit we now produce is not the things of this world. We'll present, we'll present fruit worthy to be given to God. Faith, rejoicing, peace, turning lost souls from Satan to God. Verse 23, for the wages of sin is death. Can one obey the gospel and still continue in sin? The answer is no. 
No. We have a choice. Do we love the world and the things of the world more than we love God? Now, I dare to say that most of the world, and even sadly some in the Lord's church today, will answer, yes, we love the world. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. John 14 and verse 15. One last thing I want to look at. Over in 1 Peter chapter 1. Again, verse 14. We're not going to read this whole section because we don't have time. But I do want to touch on a couple of things from here because it kind of gives us an idea of why it is important to God that we give up sin. Chapter 1, begin verse 14. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. The gospel is that which calls us to God. The knowledge we gain from the Word of God then helps us to understand who we are to serve, and that is not the God of this world, but the God of the creation. And one of the things we strive for is an understanding that by His very nature, God is holy. There is no sin in God. And what are we commanded to do? Be holy as He is. Well, I don't know about you, but in order to be holy like God, I cannot hold on to sin and truly be holy. To be holy means to be set apart or dedicated to God. We are to be holy for at least two reasons. The first reason is that given in our text, for I, God, am holy. And for any of us, that ought to be enough. If God is holy, we ought to be holy. That God has called us through his gospel is, is a holy God. He himself is set apart from sin and wickedness. His very nature does, demands a similar holiness on our behalf. And it is also Jesus' desire that we also be holy because he died for that very purpose. When we think about sin, we think about the gospel and how that it is to be that which will help us to destroy the love of sin. In Hebrews chapter 10, beginning of verse 24, but I want to zero in on verse 31. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Go back to the Old Testament, even into the New. God has always dealt with his people in a loving way. He has cared about his creation. He has given him the things that he must do in order to be saved. But just like in the Old Testament, when we get so far away from God, there is no coming back. Our prayers are limited, hindered. Our ability to live a faithful life is stopped. And we began to look just like the rest of the world. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. We must give up sin in order to fulfill our obligation to the gospel. Thank you for your time.